boy, I'm glad to be here this morning and uh, honored to get to be with you, dear folks, and uh, try to be a blessing. Uh, I do always count it a privilege, and I am, I am, you get stressed when you're going to preach. People call it nervous, I call it stressed, amen, and uh, I, I, I might ought to tell Tony, I'm sorry, I was walking around here and, and herding them youngins, y'all probably seen me there, and Tony comes up to me, he's like, hey, Brother Caleb, how are you, amen, you know, are you, are you excited to be here? I'm like, yeah, Tony, I'm glad to be here, he said, well, why ain't you smiling? <laughs> thinking, because well, I'm about to throw my guts up. I'm so stressed about it. Amen. And so uh, I, 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 I count it a privilege, and I, I, count it to, I consider it to be a serious thing when you stand and preach, and I am honored. Uh, thank you, Brother Ed, and uh, I want to try to be a blessing. Grab your Bibles, turn to the book of Mark, chapter 5, and uh, I'm going to try my best to be a help to you. I appreciate that good singing. Boy, that's a blessing to me to hear the songs of Zion before you get up to preach. And uh, I love, I love Miss Kelly. Boy, she's a blessing to me. And, uh, and she, uh, she, she sang some songs back when me and Heather was first getting into pastoring there over at where we're at. And, uh, and she sang some songs there that I hold dear to my heart that has been a blessing and a help to me. I'm just glad to be here. I want to be a blessing to you. Let's look what the Bible says here. Before we do, you know, Brother Ed was talking about them hillbillies. You got to watch them. No, it's okay. You know, I understand. I've been raised around them my whole life, and I might even consider myself one personally. You got to watch them. I was thinking about that young lawyer, fresh out of, uh, you know, passing his bar exam and making a big old bunch of money. And, you know, he thought, I'm going to go and enjoy a good trip duck hunting. How many of y'all like to duck hunt down here in Georgia? I, I reckon that's a big thing. And, and, uh, and so he did, and he went, and he, he leased out this property, and he went down there, and he went to hunting and went to calling, and a good little pack of ducks come flying through, and he shot one. And that duck come down, and it landed right across the fence row on that property boundary. And he walks over that fence row, and he knows that that is not his property. He's not supposed to be over there, but he looks around. He don't see nobody, so he just crosses the fence and goes to pick up his duck. And about that time, this old hillbilly steps out in a pair of bibbed overalls, still toe red wing boots. And he's got, he's got his hands in his pockets. And he said, son, that's my duck. And that lawyer said, sir, I mean, I realize it's on your property. He said, but I just shot it over on mine, and it's falling across the fence. He said, if you don't care, I'd love to just take it, and I won't be back, and I'll try to make sure it don't happen. He said, son, he said, you don't understand. He said, that's my property. And that's my duck. And that lawyer said, sir, I'm a lawyer. You don't know who you're messing with. And if you keep this up, I'll sue you for everything you're worth. That hillbilly said, son, we don't work like that. That's not how we do things around here. He said, well, how exactly do you do things? He said, we do the three-hit method. He said, the three-hit method. What in the world is that? He said, I'm going to hit you three times, and you hit me three times, and we'll just keep doing that till somebody gives up. Whoever gives up first forfeits the duck. And there's that lawyer, young, scrappy dude, in pretty good shape, and he's looking at this old, beat-up redneck, or hillbilly, and he's like, this guy doesn't have a chance. He said, deal. That hillbilly said, all right, sir, but I get to go first. He said, no problem. Well, that hillbilly walked over to him, grabbed him by the shoulder, and just sucker-punched him right in the gut. Well, that lawyer doubles over, and when he did, that hillbilly kicked him right in his teeth just as hard as he could with them steel toes, knocked him on his back, stepped over beside him, and kicked him in his ribs just as hard as he could. Here's this lawyer needing to go to the emergency room. He gathers himself and gets up, and he says, all right, it's my turn. Hillbilly said, oh, you can have that duck, man. It don't matter. <laughs> you got to watch him hillbillies, Brother Ed. Amen. Thought that would help the mood and lighten us up a little bit. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. Yeah. Ain't it good to be saved? Amen. Good to be in the Lord's house. Yeah. You can have that duck. It don't matter. Shoot. Amen. Look with me at verse number 22. Mark chapter 5, verse 22. The Bible says, And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. And besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come, and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus, with him, and Jesus went with him, 
and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had and was nothing better, uh, but rather grew worse. And when she had heard of Jesus, uh, came in the press behind him and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body uh, that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing, but the woman, fearing and trembling, fell, or uh, trembling, knowing uh, what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. He said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. And while he yet spake, there came a ruler of the synagogue house of the certain, which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for this good, beautiful day we've gotten. Lord, I thank you for the good friends of the faith. And I thank you for this great privilege and opportunity to try to be a blessing to these dear folk. And I stand before them, Lord, inadequate entirely. And I am in desperate need of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to move across this congregation and, to, and that, Lord, your word would not go out void. Lord, I can't change nobody, but, Lord, you can change anybody. And, Father, I just pray maybe there might be somebody here this morning in need of a strength from your word. And, Lord, I pray that you would give them exactly what they stand in need of. I pray for unction. I pray for anointing. I pray for liberty. And, Lord, if there be anybody lost, I ask, Lord, you'd save them. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. I enjoy this passage of Scripture. Um, I'm, <clears throat> I'm one of them drug babies. I was raised... I was raised on drugs. I was drugged to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I was drugged to every night of vacation Bible school, every night of revival. Uh, I've been in church my whole life, uh, about nine months before I was born. I'm one of those. And there's my cliches for the hour. Amen. I know y'all have heard all those. Uh, I, <laughs> and, and just like you, I'm sure most of y'all, I've heard many messages in this passage of Scripture and many different thoughts that, that go right along with this. And... And uh, it's so challenging when you're trying to develop a message to preach because you want it to be fresh. But in the same time, you've got to maintain this understanding that the Word of God doesn't go out void. Amen. And that it doesn't matter how many messages and it doesn't matter how many people think they've got the Bible figured totally out. Uh, we have and you have in your laps this morning, listen to me now, an inexhaustible Word of God. You're never going to reach the bottom of the depth of God's perfect and pure Word. And here in this passage, we've got something before us that a lot of people have heard messages on. We've heard of many of thoughts dealing with these issues and these sicknesses and, and the, uh, the touch of our Lord and Savior here in this passage. But I want to draw your attention here to that last statement there in verse number 35, how that they looked at the Lord or rather, they looked at, uh, uh, looked at this man, Jairus, and they asked him this question. They said, Why troublest thou the Master any further? And as I read my Bible and as I considered this passage and, and in time and preparation, just trying to get what God uh, would have for us to see here, I began to consider the thought of us being a trouble for the Lord. There's been times in my life, and I'm sure you have too, where you have been in a situation that you would consider to be a trouble in your life. If that's you, say amen with me this morning. Amen. Hey Amen. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that men are a few days and full of trouble. It's coming, friend. Peter said it like this. He said, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is going. It's going to try you. It's coming your way. You're going to go through hard times. You're going to have troubles, friend. But what we need to remember today is, listen to me, our troubles are no trouble for the Master. 
You know, I was raised right my whole life. I was raised to talk right. I was raised to walk right. I was raised to be right. And I got saved when I was seven years old, and I've been nurtured in the admonition of God and His Word by good, godly, a good godly man and a good godly woman, and my mom and dad. But you listen to me, and you listen to me well. There's been many a days in my life where I've had troubles. And I have went as far, Brother Ed, at times to get down on my knees, embarrassed before an almighty God because I'm having to go before him again over something that I of all people ought to know better than to have to put myself into. Somebody say amen. amen. Those self-inflicted troubles, those troubles that uh, we knew better and we still fail him anyways. And can I just remind you something before I get started today? Even those self-inflicted troubles, friend, hey, they're no trouble for him. There's no sin that's unforgivable. Hey, there's no, there's no transgression that he can't wash completely away this morning. Hey, I'm glad to know, Brother Ed, that our troubles, even though sometimes they're self-inflicted, hey, even though sometimes we know better than to put ourselves in such a situation, we serve a good God whose troubles, listen to me, whose troubles are no trouble for him this morning. Boy, it's good to serve this master. I want you to notice a couple things here in this passage. First, I want you to notice the availability of the master. The availability of the master. There in verse number 30, the Bible said this. It said that after she had touched him, after she had been healed, it said Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about and said, who touched my clothes? Well, I'm glad we serve an available master. Well, I'm glad that it doesn't matter where I'm at. You know, the Bible said that Jonah was in the belly of a whale yeah. in the bottom of the ocean, yeah. and he called out, to God, called out to God, and the Lord's ear had not waxed short. Amen. You say, Brother Caleb, you don't know how low I am this morning. Brother Shirley, you don't know what I'm going through, and I don't know if God can even hear me I'm so low. Well, I'm glad that in, in days where I was so low, and just wrong in the sight of God that his ear, Brother Ed, had not waxed short. Amen. Well, I like to remember sometimes about those days, friend, when in my life I was going through some dark times and I was in my prayer closet by myself, calling upon God and wasn't doing any good and got done and got fed up because I was so sorry and low. And I was on my knees in my old house there over in Summersville. <laughs> and I got fed up with myself, and I just got up out of my prayer closet. And I said, Lord, sometimes I wonder if, I'm just, yeah. if I ain't doing any good. And listen to me now. I said, Lord, sometimes I wonder what the use is. I said, Brother Caleb, how dare you say such a thing? When you get low, you'll say just about anything, won't you? And listen to me. Before I made it to the living room, I got a text message from a man of God. And he said, Caleb, I love you. I know you're going through some things, and I'm praying for you. Because I've got an available Savior, see. And there was another man of God who was in tune with God enough to know that there was a dude over in Kentucky who was on his last leg, hey, on his last leg, and needed somebody just to reach out to him and remind him that God is still available, friend. Boy, it's good to know that this, this lady who had been suffering, who was considered unclean, who had been just miserable for years, just touched the hem of his garment, and by the grace of an almighty God, hey, the Bible said immediately, immediately he knew exactly what was going on. Why? Because we serve an available God. We serve an available God who is never too busy, who is, listen to me, who's never too bound up. Boy, this pastoring sometimes, I'm going to be honest with you, I ain't fit, and I ain't, I'm, it's just tough, man. You say, oh, are you going to have a pity party? No. No, I don't expect you to give me a pity party. I just want you to know, I wished I could be more. And I fail people, Brother Ed, and you don't want to, and you try to do your best, and you try to be available. But, man, sometimes this life, I mean, I've got kids. I, I'm still bivocational. I work a job. Hey, by the grace of God, I like to deer hunt because, I mean, I'm, I bleed red blood, and I'm an American citizen. Somebody say amen. Hey, man, I've got a family that lives about an hour away, and my family, my wife's family, about an hour and a half away. You get bound up sometimes. Can I just tell you something? Listen to me. Maybe this will help the preacher here. Look, if he can't be there, if he's bound up, remember something. He's not Jesus. 
if Brother Jesse, if you're in need of Brother Jesse and, and he can't be there, listen to him. He say, oh, you would say that. You're a preacher. I want you to realize something. He's not Jesus. Brother Ed, he's not Jesus. He's not the Holy Ghost. Sometimes it's impossible to be available. Yesterday, I was in Steenhatchee, Florida. I didn't even know that was a place that existed before this weekend. But now I believe it might be part of the glory land. I mean, it was an awesome place. It was amazing. I really thoroughly enjoyed the ocean, and I had never done that much. But, uh, <clears throat> I, you know, these people back home, I, I've got some folk, Brother Ed, that, that was in the hospital. I'm in Steenhatchee, Florida. You know how far it is to my house from Steenhatchee, Florida? If you drive a speed limit, it's ten and a half hours. I'm unavailable. But you know who was available? You know who wasn't bound up? Hey! You know, look, look up here. Hey, you know who wasn't too busy for them? You know who isn't too busy for you? And I begin to get on my knees and ask God to help this family and to touch them. Why? Because I've got a Savior, friend, who's available, who's not busy, who's not bound, who's not blind to our problems and blind to our troubles, friends. Hey, our troubles are no trouble for him. Boy, it's good to know we've got a good God who's able to take care of our problems. Not only do we see the availability of the master, friend, I want you to notice the accessibility of the master. The Bible said that she heard of Christ. There in verse 27, it said that when she heard of him, came, she came and pressed behind him in the crowd. Well, I'm glad that we serve a God who's accessible. She heard him. Not only did she hear of him, but she hurried to him. But notice also that she hid from him. Likely ashamed. Again, y'all realize, I, don't, I didn't go into a lot of detail about her issue of blood. But most of y'all are familiar with the scriptures. You know what we're talking about here in the aspect of being a female. And this is likely what her issue was. And according to that Mosaic law, she was considered unclean. She wasn't fit to be around people in society in that day and in that age. And here she is, and the Bible said, the Bible said that she had seen multiple physicians, spent all that she had to try to be healed. Man, this lady was broken. This lady was miserable. She was in the lowest of lows. And she hears of this Savior, and she thinks, I'm not worthy. It's a good place to start, Brother Ed. Wonderful place to start. Even though she wasn't worthy, she wasn't condemned. That's right. That's right. You know what it means to be condemned, don't you? Yeah. It's not unworthy. It's worthless. You know what it means to be condemned? When they condemn a building, you know what that means? This is of no further use. Listen to me, friend. This lady here, she wasn't condemned. She was unworthy. But by the grace of God, she was not worthless. Not to him. <laughs> you, know, sometimes, you know, sometimes we think we're worthless. God can't do anything with me. I'm of no use to him. You just don't know my master, friend. He can do anything with anybody, anytime. Boy, I've seen amazing things, Brother Ed. I've seen, <laughs> I was down in, in Steenhatchee there with Brother Jesse and his daddy and his uncle, and we got to talking a little bit about the Lord. Well, I like being around God's people, amen, where you ain't got to drink and carry on to enjoy yourself because you're miserable. Somebody help me right there, amen. I mean, you can just eat fried fish and tartar sauce and hush puppies and, Get fat on it. Hallelujah. Amen. Got to talking about, I've got a papa who lived most of my, well, I don't know if it was most of my life now. It's been, it's been a while since he got right with God, but he was a drunk for years. And uh, he's, he's just been one of those good dudes. He got saved as a young man, but got addicted to his liquor because he was fighting pain. And uh, it's amazing. He was one, he's, my papa is my hero, just like your papa should be yours. And I'm going to talk really highly of him. Don't get bored with it, I hope. Amen. He is literally that guy that I've seen take his shirt off his back for someone else's need. 
If you're broke down on the side of the road, I have seen him pull his truck over because my brother's vehicle was broke down on the side of the road. I have seen him cut a hose off of his running vehicle so that he could put it on my brother's running vehicle, or not running, and make it run, and then drive his home missing and him having to fight it just to keep it running. Why? That's just the kind of guy he is. And as a drunk, I have seen him or heard his testimony of how that people would come by and him knowing he was saved, him knowing he was not right with God, but him just being one of those good old boys that everybody thought a lot of, he would have people come by and ask him for counsel, brother, just the craziest things. You see, because listen to me, God can use anybody to do anything at any time. If God can use my papa, who was a drunk, man, when you saw Elbert Shirley running down the road, you knew to slow down and ease over to your side of the road even farther just in case he was drunk. That was my papa. And you know where he was at this morning? He was standing behind a piano over there in Summersville, Kentucky with a mandolin hanging around his neck. Listen to me. And if you'd have walked in that sanctuary, you'd never know that he used to be a drunkard's drunk. I was listening to him talk one time about being in an old pool hall, little bootlegging joint, and the cops pulled up, and they were going to bust that joint up, Brother Ed. And he said a buddy was standing there, and he had a ski bottle. Ski is a soft drink that they used to make there in our hometown. He had a ski bottle full of cheap liquor. And he looked at my papa. He said, Elbert, what are we going to do? And Elbert took that bottle of liquor, and he turned it up. He drank every drop of it. He got in his vehicle, and he drove the house. And this morning, he's standing up behind a piano with a mandolin. You say, how do you know? I know. And he's got a mandolin hanging around his neck. And he's probably taking his glasses off every couple minutes because he's crying. He takes his glasses off when he goes to squalling. And he's worshiping, and he's serving God, and he used to be a drunkard's yeah. drunk. Listen to me. Yeah. Our God is accessible. Amen. Our God Amen. is accessible. And it doesn't matter how low you are, and it doesn't matter what's going on in your life, friend. Listen to me. Hey, you, listen, the words coming off of your lips can reach the ear of the Creator. <laughs> we're unworthy of such a thing, but we're not worthless, praise God. His ear is not waxed short. Not only do we see the accessibility and the availability, I want you to notice the acceptability in Christ. Notice her fear. She was scared to death, hiding and crawling on the ground, man. Man, she was scared. Not only do you see her fear, but you see her fall. You see her submit to him. Well, that's a cuss word today. Submit. I won't bow my knee. Yeah, you will. I won't, I won't, <laughs> I'll not submit, Brother Caleb. No, that, that is a, that, that is forbidden in my vocabulary. Boy, I'm glad for the day when I just submitted to him. I'm glad for the day when I realized, Brother Ed, that my will was not the right will. That what I wanted was not what I needed. But what God had in store for me. She submitted. Not only do you see her fear and her fall, I want you to notice, thank God for the forgiveness. She touches the hem of his garment. He turns. He says, who touched me? I love the stupidity of those disciples. What do you mean somebody touched you? Man, look at this crowd. Like, dude, just stop talking. Amen. <laughs> You're about as spiritual as a tree stump. Amen. <laughs> hey, that's my boy. Don't worry nothing about him. He's, he is my son, and he can't help it. God help him. <laughs> Anyways, uh, what was I talking about? I'm talking about them disciples, just ignorant. I think about Peter on that Mount of Transfiguration. How would you like to have been on the Mount of Transfiguration? John, Peter, James standing there, Moses and Elijah, and Jesus' image is transfigured. It was amazing. Oh, Peter, <laughs> open mouth, insert foot. Man, this is amazing. He's like, look here, let's build you a temple and you a temple. And this is, this is unbelievable. And look here, God the Father talks over top of Peter from heaven above. 
How's that for another example of God can use anybody to do anything at any time? Peter, the biggest mouth in the room. That's, that is, and look here, shortly after that, he's on Mount Transfiguration. He comes off. The Lord says unto Peter, he says, upon this rock, Peter, I build my church. Now, we know Peter's not the rock, but we know that Peter was the man that, that instituted the church there in the book of Acts. And then shortly thereafter, the Lord says, and by the way, boys, I'm going to die and be buried, and I'm going to have to resurrect. And Peter said, Lord, it is not so. And guess what God told him? He said, get thee behind me, Satan. God can use anybody to do anything at any time. I was down there in Florida, and Jesse's got an uncle who's been witnessing to this boy. And this boy asked him, he said, can God? He asked him this question. He says, do you believe there are evil men on this planet? Why? Well, yeah. <laughs> like, you ever heard of Adolf Hitler? <laughs> what about Osama bin Laden? Amen. Like, what kind of question is that? And of course, his uncle was like, of course, yeah, there's evil people. And then he said this, do you believe that God can save evil people? I appreciate his uncle. He said, well, you ever heard of a dude in the Bible named Saul? Yeah. Who was a persecutor of Christians, God's people, who didn't have a bone to pick with nobody? Mm -hmm. Who tortured them? Who sat while they laid their cloaks at his feet at the stoning of Stephen? That dude Saul, by the inspiration of God himself, hand wrote most of your New Testament. You see, our God is accessible to anybody. Even though she was scared to death, even though she had fear, even though she fell at his feet, even though, even though she would just been suffering all this time, friend, listen to me. Thank God for the forgiveness of our Savior. Boy, it's good to know that we serve a Savior whose, listen to me, whose power and whose authority and whose forgiveness is a whole lot greater than any sin that you've ever committed, Brother Caleb. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've done. You don't know who I am. You don't know where I've been. But our Savior, His perfect and precious sinless blood can wash away all our sins. If you but, if you but confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us all our sins. Well, I'm glad for the accessibility of our Master and our Savior. Lastly, the ability of Christ. He said, Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly above, exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Our troubles are no trouble for him. I was walking around this sanctuary, Brother Ed. Boy, y'all have got a beautiful sanctuary. I praise, what, I praise the Lord what he's done here at Grace Baptist. And I walked around the back, and I was dragging Josiah. That's my boy, Josiah. We call him Si. And uh, I was dragging him. I might have been packing him. I don't know. He's soaking wet from his almond milk he was drinking in the car seat. And so I, and I'm dragging him along, and Bo is running circles around me. And I think I had Reese with me. And uh, I'm just being honest with you. I'm stressed. I'm walking and I'm thinking, Lord God, i got to preach. I need to figure out somewhere to herd these cats and get them concealed somewhere and get settled down so I can maybe get a little time to ease my mind before I preach. And I come around here and I sat down. And they got to singing that song about remember. Y'all don't know this, but me and my wife was unable to conceive for five years. For five years of, of our marriage, uh, we wanted desperately to have children. Desperately. My wife went to college to do ultrasounds on mamas. And for five years, she went into work every day scanning ladies, babies, and then month by month finding out how we didn't conceive again. She'd do ultrasounds on 12 and 13-year-old girls, brother Ed, that was likely going to abort them children. And come home. And it was a trouble. 
I knew on days like that I don't need to go play ball and hunt. Hey, Amen. I need to stay at the house with my wife. There'd be nights she would cry so hard that I would lay my hand over there on her and make sure she breathed for five years. And I know that doesn't sound like a long time, but let me just tell you something. That was a trouble. Whew, boy. Day after day, she'd go into work and do ultrasounds on ladies who were, who were going to have a baby. And her job was, you smile. And you show them that you're excited for them. And she just wanted to have one of her own. It was a trouble. And we went and had test after test, and them doctors would just say, ah, uh, we don't really know why you ain't having babies. There's another one. We got two of them over there. I like to listen to them cry. Because there was a day I'd have given anything. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know if anybody here has ever been through that. I'm sure you have. I've talked to people that went 10 and 15 years trying to have babies and finally did. And it's a trouble, boy. I don't think I'd still be married today, Brother Brett. I don't think I'd still be married to that beautiful, perfect bride of mine if it hadn't been for a master <laughs> whose troubles are no trouble for me. For five years, I thought, is it going to happen? I'd sit in the back of pickup trucks with Brother Bragg and some other boys who had, who had babies, and they'd talk about how crazy their kids was, and I would, I would enjoy that. But at the same time, it was just so hard. I appreciate Brother Bragg. He was always a friend to me. He'd encourage me. and Man, those five years, I got down some days. I just kept preaching. I just kept reading my Bible. I just kept praying. And my wife, man, she's a saint of saints to me. And You know, one day, I was out. I, I had some beagle hounds at the time. and I was out running them dogs to clear my mind. It was my release, listening to them dogs sing after them rabbits. And I come home, and Heather had a physical she had to have for work. And... Uh, I saw something that I had never seen before, a positive pregnancy test. I didn't know what it was. She had it in a Ziploc bag, and she had tears running off her face. And I said, what is this? I mean, what are you, what are you, what's, what are you even saying? She said, I had a pregnancy test today. Well, I collapsed my knees in my bedroom and commenced to worshiping and praising an almighty God. Look here, shortly thereafter, we had a spring jubilee. It's the first time we'd ever had. Brother Bragg preached in it, of course. And uh, a good friend of ours from back in North Carolina, where Brother Bragg's from, his name's Cole, Cole Bean. And I wanted to tell him, him and his bride, his wife. And we was off standing under the basketball goal there in my church parking lot, and me and Heather took him aside there, and I said, I got to tell you all something. Now, mind you, we'd waited five years, and it was miserable, and I had no idea why. And I hadn't known very long at this point that we was going to have our first baby. And I took Cole aside, and I said, listen, Cole, Casey, I said, we're going to have a baby. And just immediately, Casey wraps my wife up, and Cole wraps me up. And we, they were just like, praise God, man, this is amazing. We serve an amazing God, and it was just good. And, and Cole Russell, Jesse, began to weep. And he, you know him better than me, brother. He don't cry. Dude's as sorry as Karn. Amen. <laughs> he don't cry, man. He just don't. And uh, he commenced to weep. And that was weird to me. And I said, Cole, is everything okay? He said, Caleb, he said, me and Casey's been trying to have a baby for seven months. And you don't know how much of a help you and Heather have been to us. Guess what that was? That was the Lord saying, your trouble, son, are no trouble for me. You know what he was saying? He's like, Caleb, for five years, you've been mad, and you've acted like you deserve children. You've acted like you didn't deserve to go through this. And guess what? It's all been for this moment. So that Cole might be comforted with the comfort 
book of 1 Corinthians that I had been comforted with from him. Why would God let me go through what I'm going through? Why would God allow this to happen to me? What kind of God would do such a thing to me? I'm, I'm winding down. Brother Tony Shirley's camp meeting this year. Brother Lee Davis was doing a message on school for suffering saints, something along those lines. Brother Lee Davis, most of y'all probably know him. He went through a serious battle with cancer. And he stood in front of us. He don't even look like the same individual. It's amazing what God's done with that man of God. And he said, stop asking the Lord, God, why me? And he said, start asking God, why not me? Why wouldn't I have to go through something hard? What have I done for God to be, to deserve for God to just be good to me? What have I done that God would not allow me to suffer when I, when I, in this life that I'm trying to live? Listen to me, friend. He's handpicked you. Yeah. Handpicked you to go through what you're going through. Yeah. And no, if, you had it, if he had it your way, you wouldn't have chose that trial. Sure you wouldn't. But he knows better than you do. He knows a whole lot better than you do. His thoughts are much higher than yours and mine. Yes, he does. During this time, Miss Kelly would sing a song. It had this line on it, and it would say that he knows what's best. And it would say, I am so glad that he knows what's best. I could talk to you for two hours about how that five years, which now seems like a vapor, the misery I was in in that time was so deep and depressing, and now it's, a, it's like a vapor. It's almost like it didn't happen, especially when my son begins to cry and fuss, and he's got snot running out, he's got milk poured all over him. And I don't even remember him not being here, amen. Yeah. But boy... I could talk to you for hours about how that that trouble had a purpose in my life. I said, Brother Cub, I've got some troubles this morning. Well, may I remind you, your troubles are no trouble for him. Let's all stand to our feet, every head bowed and every eye closed.